My name is uh, Professor Stephen Goldstein, and I am the uh, immediate uh, past president of the International Menopause Society. Uh, and it gives me tremendous pleasure to get to moderate this uh, webinar entitled Approach to Bone Health in the Perimenopause and the Postmenopause. Uh, we are extremely fortunate to have two outstanding uh, experts and wonderful speakers in the field uh, who will speak to us uh, over the next approximate hour or so. Uh, and I'd like to take a moment to uh, introduce them. Uh, Dr. McClung is an endocrinologist uh, and the founding and emeritus director of the Oregon Osteoporosis Center in Portland, Oregon in the US. Uh, where he had an active clinical practice. He took part in multiple educational initiatives uh, and was the principal investigator in many clinical trials evaluating the effects of therapeutic agents uh, for uh, osteoporosis. Uh, he has long been involved in the development of clinical guidelines uh, for several national osteoporosis societies, uh, has been a, a member of... Uh, editorial boards of multiple journals and currently serves on the board of the International Osteoporosis uh, Foundation. Um, he will be talking to us about when to screen for osteoporosis, how and why after menopause. Uh, he will be followed by Professor Khan. She is professor of clinical medicine in the divisions of endocrinology and geriatrics at McMaster University as well as director of the Calcium Disorders Clinic and the Fellowship in Metabolic Bone Disease at McMaster University in Canada. Uh, she has more than 200 publications. She's received numerous international awards for excellence. Uh, she was recognized as being in the top 0.1% of the world's experts uh, in hyperparathyroidism by Expertscape. Uh, this particular webinar uh, has been supported by an unrestricted educational grant from Besson's uh, Healthcare. Besson's Healthcare had no role in the selection of topics or speakers and has not vetted or reviewed the content of the speaker's presentations. So without further ado, I'll hand this over to uh, Dr. McClung. Uh, take the mic. Thank you. And uh, good day to all the rest of you. It's a great pleasure to be a part of uh, this uh, IMS webinar and to share that responsibility with my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Khan. Let me uh, share my screen. I'm asked to uh, address the issue of uh, screening for osteoporosis in uh, peri- and postmenopausal uh, women. So let me make some uh, uh, introductory comments about that that we'll come back to and have time for uh, ample discussion uh, uh, when that's over. So the uh, note my disclosures, I have a long association with Amgen, uh, who makes uh, medicines, of course, for the treatment of uh, women with postmenopausal osteoporosis. Although I'm actually gonna focus on screening at the time of menopause uh, uh, because the when to screen older women with osteoporosis is uh, well known and, and very uh, straightforward. So we're all familiar with the fact that uh, osteoporosis is a condition of skeletal fragility that's due to not only low bone density, but to a deterioration in the architecture and the structure of bone. That deterioration happens as a consequence of bone loss that begins at menopause in women. And the uh, amount of destructiveness is related to the rate of bone loss. When bone loss is rapid, there's a more vigorous, uh, more destructive uh, change in bone architecture. And it's the change in bone architecture more than the change in bone mass that results in skeletal fragility and the increased risk of fracture, which we know characterizes osteoporosis. You're familiar with this uh, 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 set of data. Uh, bone density uh, reaches a peak in late teenage years or early 20s in women. Uh, 
uh, with skeletal maturity, uh, uh, with the large increase in bone mass happening uh, over the first uh, uh, a few years of puberty. Then, in healthy premenopausal women who are estrogen replete, bone density is very stable until just before menopause. Uh, so in the year or two prior to the uh, last menstrual period, uh, bone loss begins to happen as a consequence of uh, changes in uh, sex steroid hormones. There is an interval of relatively rapid bone loss that occurs across the menopausal transition that we'll talk about. And that phase of bone loss for those uh, few years result in marked deterioration in the structure and architecture of the skeleton and is perhaps an opportunity to intervene to protect women who are at risk for osteoporosis from developing uh, the skeletal characteristics of that disease. We've learned a great deal about the changes in bone density across the menopause from a variety of studies, but probably the most important of which is the SWAN study, the study of women's health across the nation that for the past 20 years has followed a cohort of women uh, who were uh, pre or perimenopausal at the time they enrolled in the study and were followed across the menopausal transition. Uh, bone health was only one part of that very large study, but the data from the study has informed us uh, a great deal about that. So uh, the women on average uh, were 42 to uh, 52 years of age, uh, on average about 48 when they enrolled in the study. Uh, they were all uh, still experiencing menopausal bleeding, and so had not yet uh, entered into the, the, the uh, literal phase of menopause, and then were followed at least annually uh, with uh, bone density measurements and clinical history and a variety of other things. What was noted is that during the six year span, uh, six year period spanning the menopausal transition and early menopause, the cumulative bone density uh, loss, uh, the average changes were about 10% in the lumbar spine and about 8% uh, at the femoral neck. Uh, the 10% loss in the lumbar spine is almost one T score unit of uh, bone density. And we'll come back to that uh, in a moment. We also know that the uh, bone loss that happens at the time of menopause related to uh, estrogen deficiency, it results in, again, a marked deterioration in bone structure. We have that information from both bone biopsy studies shown here and from a trabecular bone score, an indirect measure of bone structure that I'll show you in a moment. These are bone biopsies from the same patient uh, in the placebo arm of a study that well, it was done many years ago now uh, in early menopausal women, uh, evaluating the effectiveness of residronate, of bisphosphonate, to prevent perimenopausal bone loss. Uh, this, uh, uh, the, the, the biopsies at the baseline and one year later uh, are shown for an individual patient. Uh, and this patient was chosen to reflect the average changes in the group of patients uh, who were in the placebo group. The individual data is shown in the graph uh, on the right. During one year uh, uh, in early menopause with no intervention with estrogen or osteoporosis drugs, there was a, a very modest decrease in bone density measured by DEXA of only 2%, but a substantial decrease in trabecular bone volume assessed uh, uh, histologically on the basis of the bone biopsy and a moderate but statistically significant decrease in the connectedness of the trabeculae, uh, a measure of bone architecture. In contrast to that, the women who were in the re residronate group had a small increase in bone density, uh, a, a, a modest increase in trabecular bone volume, and a stability of connectivity, demonstrating that with a, a, an anti-remodeling drug or anti-resorptive drug like residronate, which has about the same effect on bone remodeling as does estrogen, that that loss of bone architecture uh, in early menopause can be uh, prevented. The indirect measure is uh, uses 
a technique called trabecular bone score. This is uh, a, a, an algorithm that can be applied to uh, routine lumbar spine uh, DEXA images. It looks at the heterogeneity of the uh, distribution of density on that uh, spine scan and is known to be an indirect measure of trabecular microarchitecture. A TBS measurement uh, is an independent predictor of fracture risk, independent of bone density, and is one of the, the, the only thing that has been actually incorporated into fracture risk prediction tools uh, like FRAX. Shown here are changes in a trabecular bone score over the menopausal transition in the SWAN study. And over the 10 years beginning, uh, uh, a few years before menopause, extending to five years uh, after menopause, there was a decrease in TBS of 6.1%, again, supporting the thesis that the menopausal transition uh, and its relatively rapid bone loss is particularly damaging to skeletal integrity. We'll come back and talk about why that's important uh, 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 in a bit. We also, uh, from the SWAN study, have learned that uh, the baseline bone density at the time of menopause, as well as the rate of bone loss, are uh, predictors of fracture risk over a, a long interval of time. So uh, uh, analyses were done after women had all completed the menopausal transition and women were divided into those who had higher or lower than average bone density and whose rate of bone loss was above or was faster or slower uh, than the average. And then what's shown is the hazard ratio for uh, a lumbar spine fracture and for uh, um, uh, 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 has ratio for fracture based on lumbar spine and femoral neck bone density. So women who had high starting bone density, uh, even if they had a fast decline in bone density, had a, a modest risk of uh, fracture. Uh, for women who had low bone density, even if they had a slow decline in bone density, their fracture rates were higher. And then the group that had the uh, low bone density and a faster rate of bone loss had much higher rates of fracture. So the combination of low bone density and increased risk, uh, increased rate of loss uh, uh, predicted increased rates of fracture over a follow-up interval of more than 10 years. The summary or conclusion from this paper was that the long-term clinical implication of our results is that the menopause transition may be a time-limited opportunity for short-term antiresorptive therapy to lessen a woman's risk of future fracture. From that and from other studies, uh, we know what the risk factors for developing osteoporosis are uh, if we look at women as they enter menopause. Uh, the risk factors for developing osteoporosis include advanced age, which of course is not uh, pertinent as we think about evaluating women at the time of menopause, but body weight more than BMI, uh, a history of fracture, a family history of osteoporosis and medical problems or drugs that uh, adversely affect skeletal health, we know are risk factors for developing osteoporosis. So in the SWAN study, uh, we note that uh, women who uh, were diagnosed with osteoporosis during the follow-up uh, had uh, body weights that were lower uh, on average than women who were not diagnosed their BMI was slightly lower. BMI was less helpful, uh, I think, in clinical practice than body weight. Uh, 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 slightly more women had a maternal history of osteoporosis in those who developed osteoporosis compared to those who didn't. Uh, while that was statistically significant, it was not very clinically meaningful. And then bone density at both the lumbar spine and the total hip uh, were significantly lower in the women who were ultimately diagnosed with osteoporosis than in those uh, who weren't. So uh, these provide us 
with uh, the characteristics that helps us identify women who are at risk for developing osteoporosis. Note that FRAX or the, the Fracture Risk Assessment Tool is not a part of this. Uh, FRAX was developed to predict fracture risk, not to predict osteoporosis. And so it's useful in uh, predicting and correlating with the long-term 10-year probability of having fracture. But for women at the time of menopause, uh, even those who are destined to develop osteoporosis, they will have low FRAX value. So FRAX is not useful in screening for osteoporosis uh, at the time of menopause. We also, uh, I was asked to, to uh, comment about the role of FSH and emerging data that uh, FSH itself uh, might have a, a, a direct role in influencing bone health and uh, osteoporosis. Uh, Dr. Saidi and his group at Mount Sinai in New York have uh, led uh, the charge for evaluating this over uh, a number of years uh, because of their early studies uh, suggesting that FSH might, that, that an increase in FSH rather than estrogen deficiency or in addition to estrogen deficiency might be responsible for the relatively rapid bone loss at the time of menopause, the relationship between estradiol concentrations, FSH levels, and indices of bone resorption were evaluated in the SWAN study, and that's what's shown in the graph. Some of the reasons behind that is that bone loss uh, at the, across the menopause actually begins before there is a decline in serum estradiol levels. Uh, and est the estradiol levels in perimenopausal women are maintained at the expense of gradually increases uh, in the serum FSH. The in SWAN, higher FSH uh, levels were weakly correlated with increased levels of urinary entilopeptide, their marker of bone absorption, and weakly correlated uh, with rates of bone loss. And very interestingly, uh, FSH inhibitors have been shown to prevent bone loss in ovariectomized rats. And uh, at our ASBMR meeting last year, uh, the early phase two study uh, showing beneficial effects of uh, anti-FSH antibodies that inhibits FSH action uh, on preserving bone density in humans uh, was evaluated. What's shown in the, the graph is that urinary entilopeptide values in, begin increasing uh, uh, a year or two before the final menstrual period, the definition of menopause, peak a little bit after that, and then gradually uh, fall back toward uh, premenopausal levels. But uh, uh, estradiol levels again, began decreasing before menopause actually happens, uh, and FSH levels began increasing uh, uh, a couple of years before menopause happens. So there is at least some interest in the role of FSH in addition to the role of estrogen deficiency in terms of the pathogenesis of the rapid bone loss that happens at menopause. However, to date, at least, using FSH levels in perimenopausal women to identify those women who are uh, will lose bone more quickly has not been shown to be clinically useful, whereas BMI and especially uh, low body weight are more strongly predictive not only of low bone density, but of rapid perimenopausal uh, bone loss. So let's consider what happens over a, a longer time. Uh, I've taken data from both the SWAN study and then the cross-sectional data from the NHANES a database in the United States that looks at average bone density values in the femoral neck uh, over uh, many years in healthy uh, postmenopausal women. And what I've plotted is for women who start with an average bone density value and the average T-score at the time of uh, menopause in the uh, SWAN study was a T-score of minus 0.2. Then, using the SWAN data, we can uh, observe the relatively rapid decrease that happens uh, 
in the first uh, few years after menopause, followed then by a gradual progressive decrease that happens uh, uh, continuously over the lifetime of women, uh, the data from the NHANES uh, uh, study. Shown in the dotted line is the 10-year probability of major osteoporotic fracture calculated by FRAX using the average bone density uh, uh, at each time point along here. For women who come to uh, menopause with average bone density and without other particular risk factors, they have a progressive decrease in bone density and they reach uh, the threshold of bone density that characterizes osteoporosis somewhere at or after age 80. And similarly, their FRAX uh, 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 probability of having a major osteoporotic fracture approaches the uh, high risk range of 20% uh, somewhere at or after age 80. However, for women who come to menopause with low normal bone density, remember that the, uh, the average bone density values uh, in healthy uh, uh, premenopausal women uh, the, the range of, of normal is fr from a T-score of minus two up to plus two. That's the average plus or minus two standard deviations. So uh, uh, 15 or 16 percent of women will come to menopause with a T-score uh, below minus one, and some will have a T-score of minus one and a half. And I've chosen a T-score of minus one and a half as the example. We know from the SWAN study that the baseline bone density is not predictive of the rate of uh, bone loss that happens over time. So the, the trajectory of decrease in bone density with advancing age is similar in women who come to menopause with low normal bone density. And for that woman, she reaches the threshold of osteoporosis in her early 60s. And she uh, has a FRAX probability that is consistent uh, with therapy uh, in her 70s. So at an earlier time point than women who come to, to menopause with average bone density. Again, uh, denoting the fact that bone density at the time of menopause is clearly a predictor of the risk of developing osteoporosis uh, in the subsequent years. The, so for women who come to menopause with low normal bone density, even without other risk factors, the usual uh, average menopausal bone loss results in high fracture risk, and these are the women who are at high risk for developing osteoporosis, very easily identified by measuring bone density at the time of menopause. So how do we go about screening for um, osteoporosis? The gold standard, of course, is with DEXA, uh, multiple guidelines, recommend that DEXA testing be uh, undertaken in women with risk factors for osteoporosis. The risk factor everybody knows about is advanced age. So in almost every guideline, it's recommended that women age 65 and older uh, would be candidates for bone density testing, irrespective of other risk factors. But the endocrine guidelines in the United States, the Canadian guidelines, and the and uh, what used to be NAMS, the North American Menopause Society guidelines, all recommend that for younger postmenopausal women, those who have risk factors for osteoporosis would also be candidates for screening. That would include women who uh, are menopausal with a history of previous fracture, those with a family history of osteoporosis, and those who come to uh, menopause uh, by being thin, since, again, body weight is such an important predictor of low bone density. This actually has clinical significance. Shown here uh, are the, the uh, uh, prevalence of osteoporosis by various ages uh, as measured by bone density in the total hip, shown in the open bars in the femoral neck, in the hatched bars in the lumbar spine, in the gray bars, and at any site in the black bar. For women in their early 50s, uh, uh, some 20% of women at that time will have bone density values already uh, consistent with osteoporosis, and many more will have low normal uh, bone density. 
So the, these guidelines uh, recommending that we consider bonity testing for women with risk factors uh, were developed at a time when DEXA measurements were expensive. And that's why measuring bonity in every postmenopausal woman uh, was not recommended. Now that DEXA is much less expensive, it's my personal view that measuring bone density in most or if not all women at the time of menopause would be very reasonable to identify those who are at risk for developing osteoporosis. Uh, for people who object to the idea, though, of measuring bone density in all women at menopause, one can use uh, the, the general risk factors that I outlined or there is a tool called the osteoporosis self-assessment test, uh, which is a validated tool simply using age and body weight uh, that has been shown to be quite sensitive in identifying uh, uh, early menopausal women who are at risk uh, for osteoporosis by DEXA. The formula for the OST is the body weight in kilograms minus the age in years rounded uh, to the, the nearest year, uh, divided by five or multiplied by 0.2. Uh, this tool was developed in Asia, specifically Singapore, and then in other Asian countries, but has been uh, evaluated and validated in Caucasian uh, populations in Western Europe, in Australia, uh, and in North America, uh, using a cutoff value of uh, being less than two the sensitivity of this tool in identifying uh, patients with osteoporosis ranged from 85% uh, for lumbar spine bone density, uh, uh, bone, uh, uh, having osteoporosis in the, based on lumbar spine bone density, and a sensitivity of 97% for uh, uh, the diagnosis of osteoporosis based on total hip bone density. Of course, with such high the sensitivity, the specificity suffers uh, being only th uh, 34 to 40%, meaning that many women who uh, uh, were candidates for screening based on this tool were false positives and did not have osteoporosis. But it was a very useful way to identify the subset of women who had uh, or were at risk for osteoporosis. There is the website that's shown here. Uh, to access the OST calculator is simply ask for the patient's weight in either pounds or kilograms, ask for their age, and it gives you uh, the answer and the risk profile uh, based on the osteoporosis risk score uh, category. So two examples, uh, a 53-year-old woman who weighed 60 kilograms had an OST of 1.4, uh, characterized as being at low risk, a 52-year-old woman who is much thinner, uh, weighing 45 kilograms, uh, had an OST of uh, 1.6, placing her at uh, moderate uh, risk. So this is uh, another uh, totally inexpensive free way to make an assessment uh, for screening to determine which uh, women would be candidates then for DEXA testing. So why then should we screen for osteoporosis uh, after menopause. I've already made the point that the relatively rapid bone loss in the early years of menopause is particularly harmful to trabecular skeletal structure and bone strength, and that women who are at risk for developing osteoporosis early can easily be identified at the time of menopause with inexpensive screening tools. When to screen? I believe that in the perimenopause is the right time uh, so that we can identify those women for whom intervention might be considered to prevent the relatively rapid loss of bone density that happens at that time. And how to do it, again, bone density testing with DEXA is the gold standard. There are now some DEXA equivalent uh, other bone density tools like an ultrasound a device that developed in Italy called REMS. Uh, uh, but if one does not want to consider DEXA in all women, uh, then OST could be used to identify uh, candidates for bone density testing. With that, I'll conclude and uh, look forward to Dr. Khan's uh, presentation about what we do when we find women 
uh, with or at risk for osteoporosis and then to engage in the discussion at that time. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Khan. <clears throat> you can uh, start in sharing your screen. So I'm going to um, begin. Uh, so my uh, presentation is going to be addressing uh, treatment options for postmenopausal osteoporosis and perimenopausal prevention strategies. And I will build on the very valuable and uh, uh, eloquent uh, presentation delivered by my good friend and colleague, uh, Mike. These are my disclosures. And as uh, Dr. McClung uh, advised us, uh, osteoporosis is a condition where we have compromised bone strength, which is associated with the increased risk of fracture. And bone strength reflects the integration of the quantity and the quality of bone. And I wanted to just review a little bit of bone biology. We know that the osteoblast and the osteoclast work together as a unit. And in the presence of estrogen, the amount of rank ligand and osteoprotegrin, which is released, allows the amount of bone being resorbed by the osteoclast to be in balance with the amount of bone that is laid down by the osteoblast. Now, in the presence of estrogen deficiency, we see an increase in rank ligand expression, and this results in pre-osteoclasts, which are mononuclear cells, diffuse and form and become the multinucleated osteoclast. So with estrogen deficiency, we're going to see an increase in osteoclast activity. There will be an increase in osteoblast activity as well. However, the amount of bone resorption that happens results in a net deficit of bone with each remodeling cycle. And as Dr. McClung uh, described to us, this results in deterioration of the trabecular bone structure initially, and then with time, the cortical skeleton is also affected, resulting in cortical porosity and dramatically increases the risk of fracture. And anti-resorptive therapy can help us bring that balance back with osteoclast activity, once again, in balance with osteoblast activity. And the options that we have, we could give back estrogen, we could use raloxifene or other serms, which have um, estrogen agonistic effects, and we can also use bisphosphonates. Now, what bisphosphonates do, they are buried in the hydroxyapatite crystal of the bone. And when the osteoclast releases acid and enzymes and digests that area of bone, and it ingests the, the bisphosphonate, the bisphosphonate will inhibit Barnacyl pyrophosphate synthase, a key enzyme in the mevalonic acid pathway, and it prevents that osteoclast from forming its cytoskeleton. So the excess osteoclasts die. And so this way, we're able to bring that osteoclast activity back into balance with the osteoblast. There's another way that we can intervene and bring that remodeling back down into the eugonadal levels, and that is with denosumab. And denosumab is a monoclonal antibody to rank ligand. So this excess rank ligand that is being released in the presence of inadequate estrogen levels will be bound with this monoclonal antibody, and this will actually prevent the formation and the function of excess osteoclasts. So there are differences between denosumab and bisphosphonates and the mechanism of action that explains the differences that we see with the use of these drugs um, clinically. And as Dr. McClung has described, the transmenopause is one year before the final menstrual period, up to two years after the final menstrual period. And during this three-year period, we have very rapid rates of bone loss. The 10 years of perimenopause, five years before and five years after is associated with approximately 10% decrease in the bone density at the lumbar spine, and that's equivalent to one standard deviation. But the transmenopause accounts for 7.38% decline in bone density at the lumbar spine 
and 5.8% decrease in bone density at the femoral neck. And this is data from the SWAN study that Dr. McClung presented. And what we've seen is that age and weight are also important predictors of perimenopausal bone loss as they are postmenopause. Uh, we did a study looking at prevention of bone loss in the perimenopausal period. Is it possible for us to intervene in women who have low bone densities in the perimenopausal period? And can we do so with an anti-resorptive agent? And we gave alendronate in a randomized placebo control trial with vitamin D, and this was compared to placebo. And these uh, women were perimenopausal between the ages of 40 and 55. And as we've seen, FSH elevations are associated with declines in bone density and rises in bone remodeling. So these women had FSH levels, which were greater than 20 international units per liter, but less than 40. And they had at least five menstrual cycles per year. And this was a 12-month study. And what we demonstrated was that there was an increase in bone density during this uh, period in the group that was on alendronate in comparison to placebo. And this was statistically significant with p-values of less than 0 0.01 in the lumbar spine. At the femoral neck, it was basically um, bordering statistical significance and there was no change at the total hip site. We did see a reduction in the biomarkers. So there was a reduction in the bone-specific alkaline phosphatase in the lendronate group and also reductions in antilopeptide. So we can intervene in perimenopausal women who may be at a risk of developing osteoporosis as they already have low bone density and risk factors for fracture. And we may be able to preserve microarchitecture and prevent bone loss in the transmenopause. But clearly, we need longer and larger randomized controlled trials. So in postmenopausal women without osteoporosis, can we prevent osteoporosis? And we have seen that a number of molecules have been evaluated for the prevention of osteoporosis. And this includes estrogen, both oral and transdermal alone, or in combination with progesterone or bazidoxifene. We also have prevention trials with raloxifene that have been done in women who do not have osteoporosis. We have data with tybalone, and we have data with bisphosphonates, alendronate, residronate, ibandronate, and zeledronate. And these drugs have been approved for the prevention of osteoporosis in postmenopausal women without osteoporosis. Now, what about hormone replacement therapy? Well, we know that the Women's Health Initiative was conducted in postmenopausal women, and these women were treated with hormone replacement therapy for, on average, 5.2 years. And we have seen in the Women's Health Initiative significant reductions in clinical vertebral fracture, non-vertebral fracture, and hip fracture. The data that was uh, obtained from the Women's Health Initiative showed us improvements in bone density with estrogen and medroxyprogesterone acetate in comparison to placebo with reductions in fracture in a low fracture risk patient population. And we also have meta-analysis and systematic reviews demonstrating that five to seven years of hormone replacement therapy is effective in reducing the risk of spine, hip, and non-vertebral fracture. However, the effect of hormone replacement therapy on fracture risk has not been evaluated in women with osteoporosis, and therefore estrogen has not been approved as a treatment for postmenopausal osteoporosis. And we highlighted this in our SOGC, the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada, our new updated guidelines. What about raloxifene? Does raloxifene uh, prevent fractures in postmenopausal women with osteoporosis? Well, this was answered in the Moore study, and we have seen that raloxifene is effective in reducing vertebral fracture, but we did not see a reduction in non-vertebral fracture. 
So the relative risk of non-vertebral fracture, including hip fractures, was not significantly reduced. Raloxifene, we know, is a weak estrogen agonist. It is not potent enough to reduce non-vertebral fracture. What about bisphosphonates? Well, the nitrogen-containing bisphosphonates, alendronate, residronate, and zoledronic acid are effective in reducing vertebral fractures, non-vertebral fractures, and hip fractures. Not etidronate, which is not a nitrogen-containing bisphosphonate. You can see that we're not seeing an impact on non-vertebral fracture or hip fracture. And what about long-term use of bisphosphonates? Well, because these bisphosphonates get buried into the hydroxyapatite crystal, they're buried in the bone, they attach to the hydroxyapatite crystal, and they stay there for decades. And we can see that up to five years, we've seen reductions with um, uh, bis nitrogen-containing bisphosphonates in these fracture types, vertebral and non-vertebral fracture. Because the drug remains there in the skeleton, even if you stop the drug after five years, there will be relative stability after stopping the drug. And this in this in this study, in the FLEX trial, patients were on alendronate, and then they stopped the drug and went to placebo, or they continued with alendronate. The patients who continued with alendronate had further rises in bone density. However, the patients who stopped alendronate, their bone density was relatively stable. But if you look at the impact on fractures, we're not seeing a consistent reduction in non-vertebral fracture after five years of therapy. We did see reductions in clinical vertebral fracture, but we're not seeing consistent reductions in non-vertebral fracture after stopping the drug. And there were declines in bone density at the total hip site. And so the reason why we advocate a drug holiday in patients who have been on long-term bisphosphonates with three to five years of a nitrogen-containing bisphosphonate in patients who do not have a high fracture risk, who have not had prior fragility fractures, this drug that remains in the skeleton may be sufficient to preserve bone remodeling and prevent uh, declines in bone density and prevent a further rise in the risk of fracture. So patients with a moderate fracture risk who have not had prior fragility fractures still have uh, bisphosphonate buried in the skeleton that can still reduce um, the rate of bone remodeling and prevent the very high rates from reestablishing even after stopping the bisphosphonate. What about denosumab? Denosumab reduces vertebral, non-vertebral, and hip fractures. And we've seen that in the Freedom Study in comparison to placebo. And we have long-term data with denosumab out to 10 years demonstrating ongoing impact on the protection of the skeleton with reductions in vertebral fractures and non-vertebral fractures. What we've seen, though, is that when we stop denosumab, because denosumab does not have long-term skeletal retention, it's going to circulate in the bloodstream, and it's a monoclonal antibody that is cleared through the reticuloendothelial system. And after that six months, the rate of bone remodeling will go up. And if patients do not take their dose after one month of the missed dose, their rate of fracture can rise. And we've seen that after stopping denosumab, we do see a rise in the risk of new vertebral fractures. Any type of vertebral fracture is increased after stopping denosumab. And it will increase in the group that was on placebo as well because osteoporosis continues to progress with time. And what we've seen is that the risk of multiple vertebral fractures is higher. And the patients who stopped denosumab, sorry, you can't see the, the differences in the shading here with this when I was merging slides from different presentations, but the risk of multiple vertebral fractures, there was a larger proportion of multiple vertebral fractures in those people stopping denosumab in comparison to people stopping placebo.
you can see it, see it here, actually, it's a bill slide. So we can see that the people who stopped nosumab had a higher proportion of multiple vertebral fractures in comparison to people stopping uh, placebo. But the placebo group still had more all types of uh, vertebral fractures after stop after continuing without drug therapy in patients with osteoporosis. Let's talk about anabolic therapy. Well, with anabolic therapy, we can actually rebuild the skeleton. And it's important for us to know that sclerostin is a signaling protein that is released from osteocytes. And sclerostin can bind to LRP5. And this is a schematic illustration of an osteoblast. So sclerostin, which is a signaling protein released from osteocytes, binds to LRP5 and it blocks the wind signaling pathway because it prevents LRP5 uh, from binding to the frizzle receptor with wind. And we need that to happen to stimulate this osteoblast to start forming bone, stimulate gene transcription so this osteoblast will now start to form bone. But sclerostin is a signaling protein that blocks bone formation. And sclerostin goes up as we get older. Sclerostin goes up with certain disease states, such as poorly controlled diabetes and chronic kidney disease. And sclerostin goes up in the presence of estrogen deficiency. Estrogen in postmenopausal women decreases sclerostin by 50%. This is very valuable information. Raloxifene also decreases sclerostin because sclerostin blocks bone formation. The fact that estrogen can decrease sclerostin production plays a key role in maintaining bone formation. And this could be why we haven't seen these atypical femoral fractures in women who have been on hormone replacement therapy, unlike other anti-resorptive agents, such as bisphosphonate or denosumab, long-term anti-resorptive therapy can be associated with oversuppression of bone remodeling. And we have seen these atypical femoral fractures. But with estrogen, we haven't seen atypical femoral fractures, and it could be because estrogen decreases rank ligand expression, so it prevents the increase in bone resorption, but estrogen also decreases sclerostin, and it allows bone formation to be maintained. So how can we increase bone formation? Well, estrogen is an anabolic agent. Estrogen inhibits sclerostin. Teriparatide is an anabolic agent because teriparatide decreases sclerostin. But teriparatide or PTH also binds to PTH receptors on the surface of bone cells, surface of osteoblasts, and it increases rank ligand expression. So teriparatide decreases sclerostin and causes bone formation, but because it increases rank ligand expression, it also causes an increase in bone resorption. There is a new molecule called romosozumab, which is an antibody to sclerostin. Because sclerostin blocks bone formation, why don't we just bind sclerostin like we can bind rank ligand and get rid of the excess sclerost sclerostin or rank ligand? Well, that's what romosozumab is. It's a monoclonal antibody to sclerostin. And it's given once a month, and it's 210 milligrams, and it has to be given in both thighs because the volume is fairly large. And over one year, it has been shown to result in a dramatic increase in bone density and a dramatic reduction in fractures of all types. And that's what romosozumab is. So there are differences between PTH, which decreases sclerostin, but increases rank ligand, so it increases uh, bone resorption. Romosozumab does not bind to PTH receptors. It will bind, it will basically bind sclerostin, decrease sclerostin, increase the wind signaling pathway, cause more bone to form, and the wind signaling pathway and the rank ligand signaling pathway are connected. And so romosozumab actually decreases bone resorption.
And so there are differences in the mechanism of action of these two anabolic molecules. And we also have a balloparotide, which is PTHRP, and which has similar um, effects to teriparotide. Teriparotide reduces the risk of vertebral and non-vertebral fracture in women with postmenopausal osteoporosis when given daily for 18 months. Um, we have, however, not seen an impact on hip fracture because there were only five hip fractures in this study, and the numbers were too small to discern a statistically significant impact. In the Vero study, we are comparing teriparotide with an anti-resorptive agent. So what, did, what is the benefit of using an anabolic agent in comparison to a nitrogen-containing bisphosphonate in patients who have a very high fracture risk? And in the Vero study, we have postmenopausal women who have had two or more moderate vertebral fractures or one severe vertebral fractures plus low bone density. And head to head, an anabolic agent, teriparotide, decreased new vertebral fractures in comparison to residronate. And it also decreased clinical fractures, which were clinical vertebral fractures and non vertebral fractures in comparison to residronate. What about um, romosozumab? How does that compare head to head? with the bisphosphonate. Well, romosozumab in comparison to alendronate was more effective in reducing the risk of new vertebral fracture. And we're seeing reductions as early as 12 months. And then ongoing benefit in patients who received romosozumab in the first year and then went on to alendronate. So increasing the, the bone density, improving and the microarchitecture because when we form new bone, we actually form bone like uh, uh, newborn forms, like stalactites and stalagmites. Along the lines of gravity, we can reverse the microarchitectural deterioration and reverse the osteoporosis process. So improving the microarchitecture and then preserving that enhanced structure with an anti-resorptive agent is a better strategy for people who have a very high fracture risk. And we can see that improving the microarchitecture with an anabolic agent results in fewer fractures, even out to 24 months, in comparison to patients who were only on an anti-resorptive agent. And that is also true out to 48 months for non-vertebral fracture and hip fractures. And hip fractures are fractures that are associated with death. We know that 20 to 30% of people will die after a hip fracture and a significant number will not regain the ability to walk independently or live independently. And we can actually reduce the number of hip fractures. Head to head data, we've seen that giving romosozumab an anabolic agent and following it with alendronate, this is the blue dashed line, will reduce the risk of hip fractures in comparison to alendronate, continuing with alendronate out to 48 months. And look at non-vertebral fractures as well. Uh, we need to remember that um, because the sclerostin pathway requires further study, we are not certain at this time what the impact is of inhibiting the sclerostin pathway on major adverse cardiovascular events. And what we have seen in the FRAME study, when romosozumab was compared to placebo, we didn't see an increase in the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events. They were similar to placebo. In the ARG study, romosozumab was compared to alendronate, and we saw a small reduction in the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events in comparison to the group receiving romosozumab within a percentage difference. Is this because uh, the nitrogen-containing bisphosphonate works on the mevalonic acid pathway downstream to the statins and may be associated with a reduction in the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events? Or is this because inhibiting sclerostin may have an impact on on the cardiovasculature and cerebrovasculature, and this requires further study. 
But at this time, we are recognizing that there is this slight difference in the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events. And we recommend that someone who has not had, who has um, had an MI or a stroke, not be given romosozumab. So who should we treat? In our new guidelines, we recommend that we treat patients if they have osteoporosis and if they have a very high fracture risk, if they've had a recent fracture in the past 12 months or multiple fragility fractures or have a major osteoporotic fracture risk of more than 30% or a hip fracture risk of more than 4.5% over the next 10 years, we recommend that these patients be targeted for anabolic therapy. If a patient has a high fracture risk, more than 20%, or a hip fracture risk of more than 3.3% over the next 10 years, then we recommend that they could be given denosumab or they could be given anabolic therapy followed by antiresorptive therapy. For intermediate fracture risk, these are people who have osteoporosis, but the risk of a major osteoporotic fracture is 10 to 20%. These are patients who are good candidates for bisphosphonate therapy. Nitrogen-containing bisphosphonates are valuable treatment options for these patients, and after five years, they could be given a drug holiday. All of the global guidelines that are being uh, published and being updated, beginning with the IOF and the NOF and the NAMS and our SOGC guidelines and the Osteoporosis Canada guidelines, all of us agree that patients with very high fracture risk benefit from anabolic therapy to reduce the risk of fracture and then follow this with anti-resorptive therapy. And in our SOGC guidelines um, that have recently been published, we recommend that we treat based on fracture risk, intermediate fracture risk. We can give them uh, bisphosphonate, high fracture risk and very high fracture risk. We would walk them through uh, this guideline and uh, we would ask have they had a prior um, cardiovascular or supervascular event? And if they have, then we would prefer teriparatide or abaloparatide in comparison to romosozumab. And if they have a history of skeletal malignancy or radiation, then we would not give teriparatide or abaloparatide and instead would prefer romosozumab in the absence of cerebrovascular or cardiovascular events. And if those both are contraindicated, then we would recommend denosumab or bisphosphonate therapy for patients at high or very high fracture risk. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer questions as well. Thank you both very much. <laughs> We've got some time. Usually we go to about 15 minutes past the hour. There are a number of uh, questions. I'm gonna take moderator's prerogative though and ask the first one myself, um, perhaps as a gynecologist. Neither one of you mentioned the uh, uh, chemo preventive aspects of raloxifene in thinking about patients who might be candidates for that. And I'm also always concerned if there's other data, because I know that in the Moore trial, there was the NHANES-3 correction, so that approximately a third of the women in Moore did not have osteoporosis. In fact, it was a relatively low-risk group of people. The incidence of hip fracture in Moore in the placebo group was actually less then women treated in FIT1, the subset who showed a statistically significant reduction in hip fracture, was less than the treated group with residronate or alendronate. So I'm wondering if the problem with raloxifene is it has never been tested on a high enough gr risk group of people to show that effect simply based on results from the Moore trial, or are you aware of other data that, I, that I'm not aware of? No, I, I, I think that I'm, I'm quite confident that raloxin is probably not nearly as effective in reducing hip fracture risk as other more potent agents are. In the Moore trial, 40% uh, uh, of women had a previous vertebral fracture, which puts them at high fracture risk, and there was no, no evidence at all, not, not even a trend 
toward reduction in hip fracture risk, and the more recent data from the FNIH documenting that the, the magnitude of change in hip bone density it predicts how effective drugs reduce fracture risk, I think is very important. And uh, hip bone density hardly changes, of course, with raloxifen, much smaller changes than we see with either bisphosphonates or with estrogen even. Okay. Um, question for Dr. McClung. Are women with premature ovarian insufficiency screened differently? Uh, probably. Uh, uh, for women with uh, POI who have no contraindications to estrogen, uh, the recommendation is that they remain on estrogen until the time of natural menopause. And then uh, uh, what to do at that point I think would be determined by their bone density and other risk factors uh, for osteoporosis. Would you get a baseline bone density on these people who uh, get their diagnosis of POI? Uh, 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 sure, it, uh, uh, I think there's there's no downside to that, but uh, but I would not use the bone density to help me decide whether or not uh, to recommend estrogen replacement uh, uh, if they're 32 years old, uh, and then would look at bone density again uh, when they're 50-ish uh, to decide whether either to continue estrogen or to, to figure out whether addressing their skeletal health issues is an important uh, component of what we need to do. And this question is for Dr. Khan. Can anabolic therapy be combined with anti-resorptive therapy? Yeah, thank you, Steve. That's a really good question. And we do have data demonstrating that certain anabolic agents can be combined with anti-resorptive therapy for an even greater impact on bone density and bone remodeling. And we've seen that genosimab can be combined uh, with teriparatide. And the sequence of therapy is also important. We know that once patients start denosumab, stopping therapy with denosumab is a problem. So if we start denosumab, we can't switch to teriparatide because this will be associated with actually declines in bone density. But we can add in teriparatide uh, to denosumab. And we've also seen that uh, using an anabolic agent up front results in greater improvements in bone density, um, uh, followed by anti resorptive therapy, then using it the other way around. There's an attenuation of the impact on the bone density. Now, this doesn't mean that there may be less effect in terms of fracture efficacy, but sequential therapy is also important. And we're expecting to come out with really valuable sequential therapy strategies, which will guide practice. Question here, is there a known role for vitamin K2 combined with vitamin D3 in calcium absorption optimization? Aaliyah, you want to take that? Yeah, I, I think- My it... simple answer is no. Yeah. Uh, uh, th th there's hypothetical reasons why vitamin K would be interesting because it has a role in, in uh, uh, um, metabolism of osteocalcin. But there aren't convincing data uh, to suggest that that's true. But let me actually enlarge on that. First, first we've talked about two things. One is the management of women at, at, at the time of menopause to prevent osteoporosis. That's one set of strategies. Uh, many of the things that uh, Aaliyah talked about are managing patients with known osteoporosis where we have much more data and, and much uh, clearer guidelines. For women at the time of menopause, uh, uh, general measures, whether it's nutrition, uh, exercise, uh, not smoking, being nice to your kids, none of those are effective in preventing the bone loss that happens in early menopause. Uh, uh, the only way to, to prevent that from happening is either with hormone replacement therapy or in, uh, in the absence of estrogen for women who can't or, sh or won't take it, then intermittent bisphosphonate therapy is capable of doing that. So uh, the, the idea that we can prevent uh, bone loss at menopause with vitamin K or with vitamin D or with calcium or with exercise is a myth that we should uh, dispel. Yeah, I agree. Oh, go ahead. 
<clears throat> well, I just wanted to say that, you know, it's important for us to ensure that our patients are taking an adequate calcium uh, from dietary sources. And uh, remember that in the absence of adequate vitamin D, then the absorption of calcium uh, will be impaired. And in patients with osteoporosis, it is important to ensure that our patients are vitamin D replete. In the general population, we haven't seen an impact of vitamin D supplementation on fracture risk uh, reduction. But in patients with osteoporosis, it is important to ensure that our patients are vitamin D replete, especially prior to starting potent anti-resorptive therapy, such as denosumab or IV zoledronic acid, because if they are not vitamin D replete, these patients can end up with hypocalcemia in eMERGE. Agree. Uh, it's important, but not sufficient. Yes. Okay. Uh, question, do long-term use of SSRIs increase the risk of osteoporosis? No, they increase the risk of fracture, but they don't impair bone density. So they don't change the risk of osteoporosis. We don't understand uh, what the mechanism uh, is of the relationship between uh, SSRIs and, uh, and fracture risk other than increasing fall risk. Okay. These two seem to uh, segue into each other. <clears throat> this one says, this says, <clears throat> Professor McClung, can you give us indication in the agent of choice of bone prevention during peri and early postmenopausal women? Sure, estrogen. Okay. Uh, uh, why, why not? So uh, the, 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 we know that can work. Uh, uh, Leah referred to her study. The much larger EPIC study that I was a part of uh, evaluated uh, early postmenopausal women. They were treated with estrogen for several years. Uh, estrogen maintains bone density as long as it's given. Importantly, when estrogen is discontinued, the benefit goes away very quickly, just like what happens when denosumab is discontinued. And so uh, estrogen should be given. And if and when estrogen is stopped, then being on a drug like alendronate for two years or one dose of zoledronate uh, will maintain the, the, the skeletal benefit of estrogen. And then intermittent therapy, uh, two years of alendronate given every five years uh, or one dose of zoledronate given every five years, it would then maintain bone density uh, in those women who discontinue estrogen. So this may be a, a, something you just answered, but the question says, you have not mentioned Ian Reed's data on zoledronic acid being effective in osteopenia, this being relevant to bone health in younger and postmenopausal women. Sure, uh, th those were older women. They were in their late 60s. They, 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 most of them did not actually have osteopenia the way you and I would describe it. They had osteopenia at one skeletal site, but often osteoporosis had other skeletal sites. Uh, we actually studied younger postmenopausal women uh, with normal bone density and showed that, that giving one dose of zoledronate every two years was as effective in terms of uh, reducing bone turnover and maintaining bone density as was giving zoledronate each year uh, for those two years. So by taking advantage of the long-term effect of zoledronate, we can uh, minimize uh, uh, requirements for infusions and therapy, and probably minimize the risk of atypical femoral fracture. Uh, this is a pretty common question. Pathologic fracture risk with bisphosphonate. How concerned should one be uh, if and when to stop if going for dental procedure? Right. I can take this one. So uh, the atypical femoral fractures uh, are fractures of the femoral shaft, usually, and these are associated with long-term bisphosphonate therapy. Because bisphosphonates do have long-term skeletal retention, they can remain in the skeleton and they could potentially oversuppress bone remodeling and allow microfractures to accumulate, which can then go on to result in a transverse uh, fracture or a short oblique fracture. They usually preceded by thigh and groin pain. So it is important for us to ask patients who are on long-term bisphosphonates or denosumab therapy if they're having thigh or groin pain and then do bilateral 
full femur x-rays and we're looking for cortical thickening we're looking for beaking we're looking for features of an early atypical femoral fracture and if we see that we should stop anti-resorptive therapy and switch to teriparatide which can actually improve um, bone remodeling and potentially heal these fractures although this has not yet been proven in in a, a randomized clinical trial um the numbers that we're looking at are probably about one in a thousand with long-term bisphosphonate use over 10 years and possibly one in 3,000 with long-term denosumab use. Um, the It is not clear if it's a causal um, association with denosumab. It seems to be a closer uh, link with long-term bisphosphonate use. However, one up to one-third of atypical femoral fractures can occur without anti-resorptive therapy. And we've yeah. seen this in men as well with PPI use. Um, osteonecrosis of the jaw, we develop new guidelines, global guidelines. And basically the current concern is that with long-term anti-resorptive therapy, will there be enough bone remodeling to allow the bone to heal after tooth extraction or with local trauma in the oral cavity? And in osteoporosis patients, the doses of anti-resorptive therapy that is used is so small that the risk really doesn't increase to any more than one in 10,000 or one in 100,000. It's in that neighborhood. Really, ONJ is a concern in cancer patients who get IV zoledronic acid maybe once a month or denosumab 120 milligrams monthly, in whom the risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw is as high as 5 to 10%. And uh, it, for our patients who are on anti-resorptive therapy, many of them are worried because their, their dentist or their oral surgeon may be overly concerned, but they can refer to our ONJ guidelines and, um, you know, their preventive options with ensuring good oral hygiene and, and antibiotic mouth rinses to prevent the osteomyelitis that, that goes on to develop these complications. But it's really not an issue uh, in osteoporosis patients in the absence of other risk factors for ONJ. Can you comment on the role of muscle and sarcopenia and this new term of osteosarcopenia? Yeah, do you want to take it, Mike, and I'll add to it? Uh, sure. Uh, we, we know that fall risk is, uh, uh, or the falls is an important risk factor for fracture, and with uh, progressive aging, People lose uh, muscle mass as well as bone mass, and the combination of uh, frailty uh, due to a decrease in muscle mass and mus muscle function is clearly a risk factor for uh, for fracture. So, uh, the uh, while there are no new drugs in the pipeline to treat osteoporosis, uh, I'm actually encouraged about drugs that are designed to treat aging or to prevent aging. Uh, like uh, uh, drugs that prevent cellular senescence. And those drugs have been shown in animals, at least, to prevent or even reverse sarcopenia as well as reversing uh, bone health. So paying attention to muscle uh, function is important. We don't yet have a, a good way clinically to reverse um, marked muscle wasting uh, in elderly adults. So we're waiting to learn how to do that. Yeah, and I, I, I totally agree. And, and it's important for us to emphasize exercise for our patients, because when we exercise, we're improving muscle mass and the muscle and the bone work together and uh, reduce the risk of falls. Uh, but also with exercise, we're reducing sclerostin levels. So increasing physical activity reduces sclerostin, enhances bone formation, improves muscle mass. And I tell all my patients, you know, try and walk five to 10 kilometers a day. The 10,000 steps has a lot of value. There's no question. Um, I think we're just at 15 past the hour. I want to thank, there are some other questions, but we really need to wrap this up. Really want to thank uh, Professor McClung and Professor Kahn for an outstanding uh, effort. And I want to thank Besson's Pharma, uh, Pharma for their uh, uh, support of this series. And I want to remind everybody about the 19th World Congress of the International Menopause Society that will be held in Melbourne in Australia, October 19th through the 22nd.
Uh, I hope to see as many of you there as possible. I think it'll be an outstanding meeting. Uh, and with that, uh, regardless, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, regardless of which time zone you're in. Thank you all very much.